Hi everyone. Hi. Hi. Glad you could join us. Karibuni sana. Thank you. Thank you. Um Um, so good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's uh, session on uh, CME. Today we are going to be diving into matters of kiloplastics. Uh, but before I invite uh, our speaker and moderator for today, I would like to remind us to um, remain after the end of the presentations for some announcements from our desk and also from the president. So um, without further ado, I would welcome Dr. Mokiri uh, to, to today's session to start us off. Uh, he is a consultant ophthalmologist and a lecturer at University of Nairobi and also a specialist uh, in cornea and matters anterior segment. So I um, also want to remind us all that uh, you can post your questions on the chat box um, and they will be answered at the end of the presentation and if there will be any burning uh, comments or um, contributions you would, you would ask that you raise your hand from our from the participants uh, uh, tab so that we can see you and uh, uh, coordinate that very well. Karibu Dr. Mukiri. To, take, to start us off the session. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kalu. My work is, uh, I want to wish everyone a good evening. And my work is to introduce the presenter today, Dr. Nyenze. Most of you know Dr. Nyenze. He's uh, an accomplished oculoplastic surgeon. And I would like to give you some background about him. Um, he completed his master's in ophthalmology from the University of Nairobi in the year 2007 and worked as an ophthalmologist in Garissa up to 2009 and further on he went to Moranga County and worked as the ophthalmologist there up to 2011. Further from there he went and joined the University of Nairobi as a lecturer as from 2011 to date. So he has accomplished basically 10 years as a lecturer at the University of Nairobi. He trained as a oculoplastic surgeon from both the LVPI in 2010, and he did a long-term fellowship in Naravind from 2012 to 2013. So some of the top training institutions you can find in regarding eyes. In between those two, he did also the fellowship exams locally, what was previously known as IACO, now it's known as COEXA, that is in 2011. And he's also a very accomplished researcher, publishing over 20, 25 papers in peer-reviewed journals. On top of that, he's been an uh, immediate former editor of the editor-in-chief of the journal, Joexa Chando. So he's a well rounded ophthalmologist and matters of kiloplasty. He's very, very competent and he's here. We are very privileged to host him on today's topic, which will be on the practical approaches to eyelid surgery. So thank you so much, Dr. Nyanze, and take it away. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mukiri. Uh, 
are you getting me? Yes. Yes, you're clear. Yes. Oh, perfect, perfect. So thank you for that kind introduction, Dr. Mukiri. Uh, and I'm happy to be the, the, the host today uh, uh, in such an important topic. When I chose the topic, uh, I thought I would uh, give up a brief or uh, approach to most procedures in oculoplastics. I mean, in eyelid surgery, but I realized that eyelid surgery is very wide. So I have just either made one or two conditions uh, for today. And probably if I get time, I can continue with the other conditions as uh, in other CMEs. So uh, don't be disappointed if we don't uh, talk about the whole of eyelid surgery. I have realized it's such a wide topic. And if you go to everything, then at the end of the day, you leave everybody confused. So uh, my topic, um, discuss, my discussion is uh, inspired by the cases or the cases that I see uh, in my practice. That's why most of the cases will be based on cases uh, that I have handled uh, myself at uh, in, the, in, in my practice. So, and uh, to start us off, there is a, we start with one case. A 30 year old patient was involved in a road traffic accident sustaining a right eye injury uh, in another hospital, a diagnosis of eyelid laceration was made and the repair was done in, a, in, a, in that hospital. Uh, but after the repair, he started experiencing, he noticed that he can't close the eye completely. And uh, of course, he developed a lot of redness and tearing after the repair and uh, a lot of pain. So he presented to the other ophthalmologist in the nearby town and he was finally sent to me for review. When he came, fortunately, he had all his pictures. Uh, himself, he had, I, I don't know, he had managed to have his pictures uh, even pre, before surgery, he had very clear pictures. So he sent to me this picture actually before, uh, when we talked, I realized he has this picture. He told me this is how my eye was uh, after injury. Uh, I looked at the picture and I noticed, yes, there is a very extensive uh, lead laceration. Uh, starting the lead is, uh, uh, it's like there is a version from the medial canthus, not deep into the medial canthus, but at least there is detachment from the medial canthus from the upper and the lower lead with an extensive lateral uh, horizontal laceration and another one which is a little bit oblique laceration. It's difficult to see how the laceration is because of, at this area there is a crawling of tissue, so you can't tell. Uh, but you can tell this is how the, at least I could tell this is how the laceration was to start with. So fortunately, again, he gave me a picture of immediately when he was able to take the first photo after the repair. And uh, this is what I saw. Unfortunately, this is not a very good picture. I don't know how he'd taken it. I hope you're able to see. But the most important thing to notice is that there is a huge defect on, of the eyelid and the cornea, almost at two thirds of the cornea is exposed. Uh, so this is, a, this is not a very good outcome after the, the repair. And it's important to note that, that sometimes if you get that kind of a defect, as the healing takes place, uh, fibrosis is bound to happen and the defect might like, most likely tend to increase. And uh, that is exactly what happened because this is what happened. This is how the patient was looking like uh, at presentation in my clinic. At presentation in my clinic, I hope you are be able, you'll be able to see this, but I'll explain to you. There is a very huge defect of the, uh, the upper lid. It increased after the...
sorry for that. Let's see what happened to Dr. Nyenze's uh, presentation. We should be back shortly. Thank you. Hello, are we, uh, am I back? Yes, yes, Dr. you are back. Yes, you are back. Uh, screen is now sharing. Oh, this is a very unfortunate. I hope internet will be steady this time around. This uh, is very unfortunate. We, uh, yes. Okay. Uh, let me continue and then we we'll see whether we'll uh, succeed. Okay. Okay. So uh, I don't, I can't remember where we dropped off, but I had uh, already shown you the first pictures. This is the, the, the time of injury for this patient. Uh, you can see the lead laceration, especially from the medial canthus and the horizontal and a bit of oblique injury. This is, was immediately after repair. And then even the, there was a lead defect and it has increased uh, by the time the president presented to, to my clinic. So uh, let me get quickly jump a bit to another case. Uh, this is a road traffic accident patient he had seen a much earlier. And then uh, looking at him also, you can see there is very extensive eyelid uh, lacerations uh, involving the upper lid and the lower lid. And there is another horizontal near the, the eyebrow. Uh, this is a patient who had presented to our clinic. And then uh, we did our repair. And this is how the patient uh, looked in op when he did the repair. Uh, I presented this case immediately after the other case to show you how, uh, in this case, an, an, an initially looking worse patient ended up looking better. So the question came to mind, what do you think went wrong in the repair of this uh, eyelid laceration? Uh, and this is where the commonest, the, this is where my emphasis is on the commonest mistake people make when they are doing lead repair in uh, extensive lacerations. There is, anytime there is an extensive laceration and there is a flap of the skin, eyelid skin, the obicularis muscle contracts. And once it contracts, it imitates a defect. So the surgeon who did the original surgery thought there is an eyelid defect on the medial side and went ahead and did. If you looked at my second case that I presented, it looked like there was a bigger defect, but by stretching the tissues and putting them together, we realized there is no defect at all. 
So in short, this patient, if they was handled well, this patient did not have any eyelid uh, defect to start with. Uh, and it should not have ended up with that kind of uh, defect that he developed later. So what do you what do you do before you attempt a lead laser to repair lead lacerations? But problems comes when the la lead laceration is not regular or the lead laceration is complex. So the most important thing is to assess for, first of all, you assess for lead defects. Uh, and this is a point that I was making. Contraction of the obicularis muscle might make complex lacerations look like there is, there are major, major eyelid defects. The other thing you need to do, especially if there are medial lacerations is to look for the drainage system and see whether it's intact or not. Of course, you have to assess for lead margin laceration and also assess whether these are navation injury or from the medial canthus because it's, it's supposed to, un, to be handled uh, differently. Uh, during repair, what, uh, what are the most important things that you need to do uh, during repair? Uh, the most, one of the most important thing is, and is to ensure proper alignment of the lid. Of course, you know, the lid is very important for the cosmetic aspect of the eye. So the contours of the eyelids need to be maintained at the end of the injury. Uh, if you see a uh, big or complex lacerations like the one I've already uh, said, you need to take a lot of time to try to place all the flaps in their right position. So in sometimes it ends up acting like a jigsaw puzzle to try and see where did this uh, small part come from. Uh, one point that uh, I, I don't think I've written it here, but you also make sure that you limit the debridement, uh, cut as little as possible. Uh, if you notice there is a medial canthal, uh, I mean, aversion from the medial canthus, you make sure that the medial canthal suture is deep enough, enough to put the contour, because you remember the eyelid, the way it goes, it has to, it has uh, that, that area. Uh, and the mid canthus. If you leave it with a, with a de small defect, then the patient will have a lot of tearing uh, later. Uh, proper lead margin laceration repair. The eyelid, uh, the proper lead margin, if there is a margin laceration, then you go ahead and do the proper re repair. Of course, I don't want to go into details because this is very basic uh, about putting the lead margin suture but to suturing the tassel plate, and that is the most important point. And make sure that the tassel plate is sutured. Uh, you will need to place another stitch on the lash line and make sure that the lead margin uh, suture is reflected on it and make sure that the skin is well uh, done. Uh, make sure that lead, like, I mean, canalicular lacerations are well handled. And this you need to put a stents. Commonly people are using monocanalicular stents, which are popularly uh, known as a uh, mini monocast tens. Uh, you need to use the appropriate suture. Of course, uh, a small suture, the smaller, the better. Uh, most people tend to use a six or nylon in adults. Uh, if you don't want to use a nylon, you can use an absorbable, but uh, mainly uh, avoid if, of course, mostly we have vicrylia, but if you can have a monofilament, non -absorbable, uh, non absorbable suture, absorbable suture, like Sajikril or uh, there is one we usually have in Kenya called PDS. They do very well, uh, but if you don't have also uh, Vicryl is okay. Vicryl or absorbable switches are good also for the inner inner layers, especially the tassel plate uh, switching. Make sure that you take small bites so that you don't leave uh, scars on the sides of the wound. Uh, avoid vertical switches as much as possible because they will induce an ectropion by the end of the surgery. Uh, some people, if you see a vertical laceration, there is a very high chance that you'll get an ectropion with scarring. So there are some surgeons who actually primarily uh, do uh, zit plasty on the skin laceration uh, just to prevent that. Uh, you don't have to do that, but if you're able to do, then that is uh, very important. At the end of it all, you need to make sure that if there is a de defect, then you manage it appropriately. One point that I need to insist is that uh, eyelid defect after injuries are actually very rare. So before you make, uh, 
in most cases, even if it looks like there's a defect, most cases they don't have a, a defect. Uh, the, the most important thing is we are trying to do all this to, in, to, to avoid uh, uh, the lead laceration and complications that uh, might arise. And the complications, as you have said, as you have seen, uh, from this case, the worst one of the worst ones are the, like exposure from a defect, early defect. You have seen in that case, and that can lead to exposure keratopathy. And if not handled early, the patient can lose the eye from that. If the if you can see the upper picture here, this one actually in the two pictures you can see most of the defects, uh, most of the complications we get from a poorly done lead laceration. In the upper picture, there is you can see there is a lead upper lead notching. There is an entropion of the upper lid. You can see the lashes attaching even on the eyeball. On the lower lid, you can see an ectropion. Uh, you can see a, a bit of pulling of tears. Patient, this patient is experiencing epiphora from there. This patient also has very huge scars, which means uh, the sutures that were used were very large and the bites were very large. That is an ugly scar on the face. So these are the kind of complications that you want to avoid uh, in these uh, cases. Of course, um, in case you get a patient uh, that the surgery was not done well, then you need, of course, to handle the lacerations. Uh, in most cases, we need, we try to repair the lacerations, especially if there's a notch. A notch most likely means the tassel plate, chances are it was not uh, done well, and the lead margin was also not done well. So most of the times we have to revise. Uh, another uh, procedure which is very common, we commonly do is Z plasty or Z plasty for uh, ectropion. These are in cases where we have like vertical scars, like in this patient that I've just shown you. You can see there is a vertical scar for the lower lid, and there is also a vertical scar for the upper lid. So this patient uh, was came to us after repair from another place, another institution, and all that you had to do is to do a Z plasty for the upper lid and do another Z plasty for the lower lid. When you do a Z plasty, then you change the forces of the laceration uh, from uh, vertical to horizontal. And in that case, you take care of the lag of thalmos and the, the defect that is there. Of course, when you do the revision, you make sure that you excise, in this case, we excise the old scar and made sure that uh, after excising the old scar, uh, we made sure that uh, the, the the suture we use because this must this patient must have used a, a large suture. Uh, the suture we use uh, is the appropriate size. Uh, most importantly, again, uh, you can see I've uh, repeated uh, the defect uh, repair again because uh, we are going to tackle that uh, as we go forward. The repair of the of the defect. So that is briefly. Uh, a, a brief, a brief uh, discussion of uh, lead laceration. It was inspired by that case that we got with a very bad uh, exposure and uh, defect following a uh, 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 surgery that was uh, was done. Uh, I, I hope we are still together. Um, I am getting warning that my internet is stable, unstable. We are still together, Dr. Continue. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, let's go to another case. We are going to revisit that case as we go forward because there is a way that we are going to merge the two cases that I'm, I'm presenting today to at the end of it all. Uh, two of the cases that I'm presenting today. Uh, this is a patient, a 56 year old lady who presented with an eyelid mass which has been growing, which started to grow two years ago. Uh, this patient had had multiple excisions, I think three times with a recurrence. The latest excision and histology done before the two other excisions, histology had not been done, but from the latest excision, histology had been done, fortunately, and it showed a squamous cell carcinoma of the eyelid. So patient, the patient presented to our clinic, and on examination, we found an upper lid fleshy mass uh, involving the lateral side of the upper lid. It was poorly defined. Uh, as I said, it was flesh, it was a flesh mass. Uh, 
the lead margin could not be identified. The lashes could not be identified on that area and it was extending all the way to the lateral canthus and was involving a bit of the lower eyelid. The systemic examination was okay and lip node examination was okay. Uh, of course, the diagnosis is clear to us. This is a squamous uh, upper lid uh, squamous cell carcinoma, which is extending to the lateral canthus and to the lower eyelid. Uh, just before we go ahead with this case, what came to mind is this patient must have passed through, um, of course, the patient passed through the other doctors and uh, the patient kept getting a recurrence. So my question was, these doctors probably did not uh, recognize that this could be a squamous cell carcinoma. So I decided to briefly just uh, discuss uh, what could be the telltale signs of a small lead malignancy. Because all these lesions or eyelid swellings always start like very mild uh, swelling that you have seen before. Sometimes some eyelid malignancies, they can even masquerade as a calaisian. Uh, some people uh, see them as just a small cyst, eyelid cyst. Some people, uh, I mean, it's, it's possible when the eyelid malignancy is small for it to be missed out. I am not blaming the people who have, who have uh, who missed the, the, the signs. Of course, the importance of uh, understanding the nature of this lesion is because the surgery is, is, is different. If you get a benign lesion, you want to save as much uh, tissue as possible. So you, you exercise closest possible to the, to the lesion itself. If you suspect a malignancy, then you have to exercise that lesion with a, with a wide margin. And if you do a wide margin, then you have the challenge of reconstructing it. So you have to have these uh, signs in mind when you're examining a patient with an eyelid lesion. What are these things that you can look at? Uh, destruction of eyelid architecture, especially if you look at the lead margin. The lead margin has a very typical uh, look where the anterior surface of the lead margin is rounded and there is a sharp uh, posterior border of the lead margin. If this uh, orientation is, is destroyed, I, I, are you able to see my, the arrow that are on my presentation? Yes. Yes. Oh, perfect. So if that lead margin, uh, normal architecture of the lead margin is destroyed, then you need to start suspecting that there is a problem. The other thing is a loss of lashes. Of course, these things go together with the lead margin destruction. Then there's the loss of lashes. You can see from all the extent from there to here, there are no lashes. Uh, there is another uh, case here where the lead margin architecture is also destroyed. And you can see there are no lashes at all at that area. This one is a, a bad sign. Then there is another sign of the regularity. If you look at most of the eyelid swelling, calasia, calasia uh, eyelid cysts, very small lesions. Of course, we are not talking about uh, the infections which are very obvious. In that case, like internal or external audiola, you're talking about cases that could be uh, malignant. You can, most of those have a regular, very good uh, border. If you look at this case, you can see this, this is not a very well, a good border. And then of course you need to look at the attachment or oh, underlying and even uh, overlying tissue. If it's a calasion, then the skin always moves over it uh, unless there is an infection or yeah, unless there's an infection. Uh, other lesions are at least mobile, but if you, if, if you see the, the lesion is attached to the underlying lesions or tissues, then there is a possibility that that is a, that is a malignancy. Uh, of course, ulceration. And a good thing about ulceration in, uh, in malignancies, the ulceration is different. It is not normal. The, you can see that in some cases, like it's like some tissues have been uh, excavated or eaten away. You can see this lead margin uh, as a gap here. So this is not a normal wound. Uh, then of course, if you look at the borders, you can see they are elevated. And in some cases they have a pearly appearance. Uh, the other thing you could look at is uh, telegiectasia. You can see in this case, uh, the, the, the blood, the dilated tortuous uh, vessels, you can see so many of them. That is a, a sign of uh, malignancy. Of course, 
malignancies, uh, a recurrence after excision. If you have a lead lesion which has recurred, then you have to be very careful. If you do a collision and exactly the same place the, it recurs, that's not usual. Um, especially uh, be careful if you're dealing with the uh, Caucasians and uh, in, for some extent Asians, because uh, sebaceous gland carcinoma uh, masquerades a lot as a, as a collision. And uh, after exition, of course, it will, it will recur. If it recurs, then you have to look very carefully and you will see. Uh, I remember there was a, a case that uh, I saw of such a case. And these signs were there. You could see that there are no lashes, the lead margin the architecture is not okay. There is nodularity of the lesion, uh, multiple nodules. You know, in a collision, you expect it to be an, a one single nodule. But here you can see like three nodules attached to each other. So definitely, uh, that was not a uh, what that was not a collision. Of course, even the growth uh, is rapid, but again, some of these lesions like collision also the growth is also not very slow. So that is that that, that is not one of, that that is one of the uh, differentiating factors. But you have to look at it carefully. You have to look at all these things in context, uh, not just one sign. So. Uh, Back to our patient, our patient, uh, if you remember very well, had a very big uh, upper lead margin mass. So the patient was planned for, the plan of management was a wide excision, of course. Uh, and for us, we planned a temporary closure uh, for the lead and wait for histology for one week and repair the defect after that one week. Uh, we'll discuss that as we go forward, uh, that uh, week delay. Uh, and is, yes, we are going to discuss that exactly now. Uh, the best exition of, if you suspect I lead malignancies, I say the wide exition of, uh, okay, at most, I think so, not at least at most four millimeters from the lesion itself. Uh, most of the times we just prefer four millimeters. Uh, the most important thing in these lesions is to make sure that uh, the margins are cleared. Uh, before you repair the defect. Because a repair of a defect is another complex, can be a very complex procedure. And if it is a complex procedure like that, it is very, it, it, it will be very bad to repair. And when the histology comes, you are told the, the margins are not clear, then you have to revise that. But even then, uh, to revise, you will not get, uh, you will have to, revision after repair will have to be like a fresh excision with margin. So you're going to lose even more. Uh, the ideal teaching, and this is what people do in an ideal situation, is a frozen section or most microsurgery. Uh, most people do a frozen section. Frozen section means that after excision of the lesion, uh, you go further and excise the margins, label them very well, and they are taken for, for, to be frozen and examined immediately. So in that case, the patient remains in theater until the histology, uh, until you get a report from the pathologist. If the pathologist says that the sections as they're they are still malignant cells, then you continue and excise another margin and you do the same until the margins are clear. The challenge we have is the, the frozen section, the, 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 the fridge and the, the procedure and the pathologist to do that. Uh, what I know that the only hospital has the capacity to do that as we speak is Nairobi Hospital. Uh, there's a time we tried to do that with Nairobi Hospital, but they refused still. They said we can't start putting up that fridge because of only one case. So it's still a challenge even in the private sector. So a shortcut to that is what we, what, uh, we did for this case. We access that lesion. And after exercising the lesion, we didn't leave the wound clear. We just did a very rough repair of the margin. We just joined everything together, uh, of course, to, to prevent exposure keratopathy and also to prevent an infection. And made sure that we make arrangement with the pathologist to make sure that by the end of four to five days, we get an histology. And if you, if, if, if you get a good pathologist you are working with, then they can give you a report in four days. And you can go back and repair that defect before the end of the, before in, in one week's time. So we did this excision on a Monday and by Friday we had an histology. Uh, we did a histology which showed a clear margin 
and in that case we went for 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 for, for repair uh, so um, of course i've mentioned if you find a margin is not clear then you have to go back and uh, finally you're supposed to manage the result of defect and the close follow-up of the patient for any recurrence. So for our patient, of course, we went to theater, aimed at, as I said, a wide excision, around four millimeters. But the other thing you need to be careful is that when you palpate, when you palpate the lesion, we realize the lead margin is not actually, the skin margin is not actually the lead. The, the skin margin is not, is not where the lesion is. When you palpate, you could feel a lesion around this area. So we had to make sure that by you have to be very wide in excision. This is a malignancy and you want to be out. So don't, uh, you, you always have to be generous with the excision. So we actually did a bigger margin than that. And you can imagine these are the result and the defects that we got after that. Uh, a headache, but we'll uh, deal with that as we go ahead. Uh, this is our temporary closure that we did. Um, this is our temporary closure immediately after excision. We closed the lid uh, like that uh, for the rest of the week. And we got an histology. Fortunately, the margins were clear. So our challenge now was to repair the defect. So uh, in the next part of our presentation, uh, if you see in those two cases, we have got uh, a defect to repair. So in the next part of my presentation, I'm going to deal with the repair of eyelid uh, defects and we'll keep uh, referring to our uh, cases. Our case number one, remember it had a, a full thickness and today uh, I will limit my discussion to full thickness lead uh, defects. A split or partial thickness lead defects. That is a presentation for another day. Uh, this patient had uh, this defect. If we estimate carefully, generally speaking, this is almost uh, 70 to 80 percent of eyelid of the upper eyelid is uh, missing, and this is a full thickness uh, defect. So you need to do to know how to deal with that uh, problem, uh, and that is what we had to do. So for defects, we have to, first of all, uh, review the principles of lead defect uh, repair. This is, this is more so for full thickness uh, defects. Uh, for lead defect repair, and I use this principle. These are the principles I try to use in most times. You try to use the simplest possible procedure. Uh, there's, there, there's no role for heroics and trying to do complex uh complex flaps that are not necessary you try to make sure that like tissues go to like tissues uh this means that if the this is a mucous membrane you make sure that mucous membranes are switched to mucous membranes if this is skin you make sure that the skin is switched to to skin do not try to mix up uh tissues of course the most important of course and it's an obvious thing don't use two free grafts together of course, if you are to use a free graft, you need vascularization. So you have to bring a vascular flap and put a free graft if you must do that. Uh, you avoid, of course, you never, never use two free grafts together. How do you repair the defects? Uh, uh, what I do, and this is based on my experience, what I usually try to look at is ex before we start, uh, how much of the lead, uh, this is especially for full thickness, how much of the lead, how much of the defect do we have? Uh, what I usually try to see is, is this less than 60% or is it more than 60%? If it is less than 60% defect, if it's more than 60%, I immediately try to start looking at which lead sparing procedure do I need to do, or do I need a complex, do I need other complex flaps if it's more than 60%. If it is less than 60% defect, then uh, I don't have to do a lead, you don't have to do a, a lead, uh, you don't have to do a lead sparing procedure. 
So of course there are so many formulas that, uh, especially when you're residents and even the residents who are there that have been uh, described. And uh, most of the times I, you don't have to remember this uh, when you're doing the procedure. Immediately you see that this defect is less than 60%. Then the first thing you try to do is, as you can see this diagram, to do a primary closure. If primary closure is not possible, then uh, the next step is to try and do a canthotomy and cantholysis to release more tissue and see. If closure is not possible, then what you need to do is a tensile flap. And a tensile flap, then you do a, a, a skin flap, uh, is a semicircular flap. If it's for the upper lid, you make it low. Uh, on the lower side going down. And if it's for the upper lid, you make it going up. Uh, if your estimate is okay, then this lid is going to close uh, well. If you make a mistake and you underestimate the defect, you will have done all these flaps and your lid will not be there at all. There'll be a lot of tension uh, and then the lid will give way. I always say you'd rather err in, a, or if you are to make an error, you'd rather under, estimate in, as in you'd rather say a defect is um and and I estimate the defect and do a lead sparing procedure than to do uh than to 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 do all this and then uh, the, the lead cannot be closed uh in lead sharing procedures then you do it depends lead sharing procedures depends on where the defect is if the defect is in the upper lead the most commonly used lead sharing procedure is the cutler beard a procedure. If the defect is on the lower lid, then the commonly used uh, procedure is called the use procedure. Uh, I am always um, I, I always like cutlabiate procedure because you bring up the posterior lamella and the anterior lamella at the same time. The use procedure, what you do is you borrow only one lamella, and that is the posterior lamella and you have to look for the anterior lamella, either from a free graft or a skin. Uh, there is something which some people have described called the reverse cutler beard, where you can do a similar procedure like the cutler beard for the low, the, that uh, we have described for the upper lid, you do for the lower lid. The, this, this has been discouraged because of the levator muscle, which can be damaged during the reverse cutler beard uh, procedure. But I could tell you that I have tried because it's faster and shorter. I've done reverse cutler beard in some patients uh, and it has worked quite well without any damage to the levator muscle. So it's that, that is also something that people can consider. When you talk about cutler beard procedure, uh, you can see, we said this for the upper lid, you can see the defect is more than 60%, what I've said. You can see you are sharing the lower lid. So you do an incision a uh, few millimeters from the lid margin around four millimeters, you have to leave a good, you have to, to, to avoid a bridge necrosis. In that case, you have to, let me don't shout, don't shout. You have to leave enough bridge to avoid a bridge a necrosis. Uh, then you do a full thickness incision on the marked area and then pull the posterior lamella and the suture to the posterior lamella, remember like tissue to like tissue. Then you pull the skin over the, over the laceration and the suture it to the skin and the muscle that's anterior lamella and suture it to the anterior lamella. And then you leave uh, that for approximately six weeks and then you divide the lead after six weeks. In that case, you have, uh, and then, okay, of course you suture the, the remaining part that you return back and uh, make sure the lead margin contour is good as you do the, the separation. That is briefly on a cutler beard procedure. Use procedure, as I said, you borrow the posterior lamella. So you, fl you, you flip, uh, you evert the upper lid, you make incisions just like a cutler beard, but only on posterior lamella. This is called a tasso conjunctivo because you cut a bit of tasso plate. Uh, important to note is some people even for cutler beard, they do a graft of a tasso plate which I don't do and it has worked well for me. Uh, this is a tassel conjunctivo, so you put a bit of tassel plate in this one. Then you flip the posterior lamella and then you suture it 
uh, then you switch it uh, to the posterior lamella. Then you have to look for the anterior lamella. The anterior lamella you can put now at this stage a free a full thickness a skin graft like it was demonstrated here, or even a flap, uh, a rotational flap from the lower lid. You have a lot of tissues in the lower lid you can work up with to get a flap to cover this uh, posterior lamella, I mean with the, the anterior lamella of this. So that is what is called a use procedure. And then again, it has to be divided in around uh, six weeks. Remember I said, uh, uh, somebody can try a reverse cutler beard, which I have done and it has worked well for me. So back to our patient, he had around 70% defect on the upper lid. And as we said, the best procedure for upper lid defect is a cutler beard uh, procedure. This is in theater immediately after uh, the cutler beard uh, procedure. Of course, we had to stretch the tissues on the lateral side a little bit because that is where they were the levator also, you remember the levator muscle. Uh, you, as you do the bites, you try to pull the tissues and see whether you can see a bit of the deep tissues to, to bring the levator because you want the lid to open after the, the surgery. So this is how the patient was looking in immediately after the cutler beard procedure uh, was done. Uh, it's not very clear picture in this one. He sent me immediately. This is immediately after opening. Uh, you can see a bit of tosses there but that clears as the lid gets a little bit lighter. You can see a month later, uh, the, the, the palpebral fissure height is, is not bad. It's not the same, but at least this is totally acceptable. Fortunately, the exposure keratopathy, which was, development, was developing for this patient uh, healed. Uh, in, in case you forgot, this is the original patient we got, uh, which uh, we had an extensive lid laceration that uh, repair, was repaired. So basically that is the approach of um, repair of a full thickness graft uh, of either the upper lid and the lower lid. Uh, and this happens especially after addition of lid lesions, but in some cases you can get like our patient here, a poorly done a lid laceration, which uh, uh, led to a defect. Uh, but unfortunately, things don't are not always that clean. When you look at textbooks, they always draw very good or the pictures are always of very good defects. But that is not always the case. Some defects are complex. What are complex defects? Complex defects are extra large defects. Like in our patient here, you can see this patient as for the upper lid as almost a, a more than 50% defect. For the lower lid as a think slightly less than a third of defect. And there is also a defect, there is totally no lateral canthus and the skin around, there is a defect of the skin around. So this, 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 this is totally a complex defect. Medial canthal defects are also uh, considered uh, complex because you can't do some of these uh, procedures we have mentioned. We have mentioned about, uh, uh, we have mentioned about uh, catalabiate procedures we have mentioned about uh, a semi, uh, tensile semicircular flaps. So those are not things you can do if the defect is totally on the medial canthus. Uh, there are also lateral canthus defects, like you can see in this case, we have a lateral canthus. And then you can have even big complicated uh, defects. You can even have a combined upper and lower lead defects. Like this one is combined upper and lower. You can even have a total loss of both of upper and lower lead uh, eyelids. This is a case uh, I, I, I saw last, last time, uh, Dr. Washira, a, a case where the patient did not have even upper and lower lead after excision of a mass. And that one is totally complicated. I am not going to deep details about this. I think, uh, of course, when you get such a case, uh, you probably will have to consult an oculoplastic specialist. Uh, one thing, and that is why I into details into this uh, cutler beard and the, and the use procedure. Uh, those are cases if you do not have an oculoplastic specialist, you don't want to, you can't, you don't have to wait for a exposure keratopathy to finish a cornea because of those procedures. Those are procedures most likely uh, if you, 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 you commit yourself to learn, you can learn. But some of these flaps, of course, you can also learn and they do them. 
but I'm not going to deep details into them. Uh, that that will be a little bit uh, complicated. Uh, you can have glabella flaps. Those are media, especially for mediocanthal uh, def mediocanthal uh, uh, defects. You can have forehead uh, flaps also for can be for mediocanthal lesions or even uh, you can have nasolabial flaps. Those are for lower lid uh, defects. You can have lateral forehead uh, flap that is for lateral canthal legion uh, defect. Then you can have a mustard cheek rotation flap that's for very huge defect of the lower eyelid. Uh, without going into further details, we go back to our patient. Of course, now this is a complex uh, defect according the way we have done. So in that case, also you have to do complex uh, repair. In this case, uh, looking at it, of course we have a lead, a lower lead uh, de defect, but we saw that there is a tissue we can follow. We can borrow again still from the lower lead with its own defect. Uh, we are limited. Uh, we have limited choices, so we decided to do a cutla beard for the lower lead and uh, lateral forehead uh, flap for the for the lateral canthal uh, defect. Uh, and uh, uh, fortunately, we managed to cover the defect. Uh, this is uh, the patient uh, like a week or two after the repair. Uh, we discharged the patient, uh, but unfortunately the patient, uh, when we discharged the second wave came and nobody, and she has not come. So she's still at home with her, her eye totally uh, covered. So we are hoping that she'll come. We, uh, back for, for revision. So unfortunately, I can't give you a feedback on how the patient looks uh, after that, probably that can be, can be done uh, later. So in short, uh, or in brief, um, what I've tried uh, to do is uh, to tackle those two issues. There are so many uh, procedures, as I told you, or things that you need to do to cover for eyelid. Uh, and uh, for now, I, I think, uh, uh, not to confuse everybody and not to to give you so many things that will confuse people i beg to stop at that thank you very much okay thank you dr nyenze for such a wonderful presentation with a very practical with as you promised and very good pictures showing the the problem that you are faced with and how you approached it. I'm looking in the chat box. Um, Everybody is happy with your presentation. Thumbs up. And um, somehow I feel oculoplasty was is a very enjoyable. You see very good results uh, if you know exactly what you're doing. Anybody with a burning question, they can also raise their hand and ask direct or can put their questions in the chat box. There is a question up for Dr. Mukiri, maybe you take a look. Okay, there's a question to Dr. Nyanze. The question is from Dr. Masila. She's asking, how can one know which cases to refer and which ones um, they can handle at a, maybe at a peripheral facility? We know most of our patients probably don't, cannot come in time. They are financially challenged. So we may refer a patient and they never go. Wow, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Masila, for that question. And uh, this is uh, th th this is the challenge that many people have. Uh, we, we are not many. Oculoplastic specialists are not many, so you cannot start referring every eyelid uh, laceration to or every eyelid uh, lesion to us. Uh, of course. It's always good to update on your skills on the common uh, issues, because as you know that 
common problems have occur more commonly. Lead laceration repair, that is something that almost uh, every ophthalmologist can handle. What, what the biggest problem that we faced is what I, I, I talked about. Uh, somebody easily saying that this is a, a defect and trying not to, 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 to close it uh, adequately. So with proper, with, with proper skills and the proper understanding of the lesion, uh, I'm sure most ophthalmologists can handle uh, most, uh, most issues. Or they can, most ophthalmologists can handle uh, most lead uh, lacerations. Uh, repair, uh, the, the question about uh, defects. Uh, excision of uh, lesions, uh, of course, small lesions is very easy to excise. And that is why my emphasis is, please try to know which lesion it is before you excise. And in that case, you don't have to do a complex repair. On the other hand, and this is always the teaching, if you are not sure, then uh, it's always good uh, to, to refer. So it's always good to, 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 to advise yourself with the knowledge of uh, what is the best way to handle these uh, uh, problems. Thank you very much. I hope I've answered your question. Okay, thank you, Dr. Nyanze. There are two questions which are quite similar, so I'll give them to you. So one is, uh, please highlight the pr procedure of the repair of the lower canaliculus which was involved in a medial aspect, in the medial aspect in a later lead laceration. Uh, that is from Dr. Gohill and one from Dr. Mundia. How useful is pigtailing in canalicular injuries? So those ah, are two questions. Good. Yes, yeah, this, this is, uh, these are good questions. Canalicular injuries are very complicated. And what I've noticed is that in most people, uh, they have uh, left them just unattended or they just went ahead and repaired. A pigtailing is the, the old way that uh, the old teaching about the repair is a little bit uh, complex and most people don't have the pigtail itself that is used for pigtailing. So that has run out of uh, practice in most sense centers. Uh, and what has come in uh, of late and has become a bit easier is the use of uh, monocanalicular stents. Monocanalicular stents, bicanalicular stents are also there and they are a bit difficult, especially if you have to retrieve them from the nostrils. So monocanalicular stents helped a lot in the repair of these. Uh, unfortunately, they are not av available in most places. And that's why most people end up uh, just repairing the lead uh, like this. Now the repair, the use of monocanalicular stent is that you identify the punctum itself where it is, you pass the stent through the punctum until the, the monocanalicular stent fits very well into the punctum itself. Then you go back and identify the other part, the distal end of the, of the laceration, and you pass that stent over there. When you do that, you then suture the, the tissues around. You don't, you don't have to identify the, the, the mucosa. Of course, you have seen the mucosa when you are passing the stent, but you don't have to so much suture the mucosa. But the tissues around there uh, and approximate them well, such that the, the mucosa from the other end also touches the other end. And then after the repair around the tissues around there, then you, re, you do the lead margin and you wait for uh, between a month and uh, six weeks, and then you remove the, the stent. That is the best, uh, that is the easiest way that I've seen for repair of canalicular that I have always uh, preferred. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Nyanzi. I hope they, uh, it was clear and uh, Another question comes about is when performing the cutler beard procedure, is there a limit to how wide the flap can be or should be? Well, yeah, that, that, that's a very good question. Uh, yes, there's a limit how the wide the, uh, the flap can be. And the limit is because of uh, the, the limit 
is because of the, 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 the medial and the lateral canthus. You need to be slightly inside. It can be wider than you have seen in, in these pictures and uh, what, uh, what I've done, but you have to be slightly inside the medial and the lateral canthus. You don't want to squeeze a, a flap which is a bit wider than the, the medial and the lateral canthus. So you can get a flap which is um, wide enough, but it has to be within, inside the medial and the lateral canthus region. The biggest problem, and this is uh, the biggest problem, and this is where you have to be careful, is the bridge itself. The bridge has to be wide enough to capture or to have the, the marginal uh, vascular arcade. The vessels have to be there. Otherwise, you get a, a bridge necrosis and the, the outcome will be not, the, the outcome will not be good at all. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, you had uh, the um, question from Dr. Mumani. I, uh, he says, he's asking which sutures do does someone use when doing the Z plus T repair? Is it different from the ones if it's just a normal uh, laceration or these ones are different? Well, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, we just handle it the same. But in, 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 in the deeper tissues, you can, uh, instead of a six zero, you can do a five zero, something a little bit stronger because uh, you can have a bit of tension. But when it comes to skin, I always try to avoid to use something bigger than a, uh, uh, bigger than a six zero. So inside you can, uh, you, you can do even a five zero, but outside just maintain a, a six zero. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so most of the other comments are mainly in um, congratulating you to a very good presentation. Uh, someone has given the experience that is Dr. Inoti, where they had seen a, a lead laceration and it looked easy to repair, but it eventually became a very big challenge because he had done under local anesthesia but uh, good luck was on his side and it had a very good outcome so in future he says he will choose to sedate so simple looking simple does not mean the surgery will also be simple yeah thank you thank you dr Inoti. that's important if you saw the patient i, sh I showed you the second patient i had done uh, it's actually a little laceration that I did. You could see that this, this is under GA. So uh, GA, if it's, it's that complex, just go under GA. You'll, you'll have enough time to, 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 to you love, the, the patient will be relaxed. As I told you, there is a lot of stretching to do uh, to get that the lead, because the lead really can contract. It can go all the other side until you even start imagining that you don't even have the upper or lower lid. So you, there's a lot of stretching to do. There has a lot of flaps to use. There's a lot of anesthesia to give. And uh, so complex lacerations, you are justified to use general anesthesia. Very important point. Okay, one last comment. There is... Um... And thank you everybody for your kind uh, comment. Another comment from Dr. Nderi says he really wish if you could publish some of these cases so that we can have uh, local experiences and uh, even give your give it your own names. Maybe you can come up with a Nyenze procedure, Nyenze plasty. Oh, <laughs> thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Nderi. Yeah, it's, it's, it's important and uh, I'll prepare some of them for publication. Most, some of the issues, uh, as you said, they, they are not textbook. You, when you are faced with this, you have to, to, to sometimes improvise and come up with something which has not been described because all these cases are, uh, the, the patients just come differently. Thank you. One last comment from Dr. Owen. He says, surgery after injury is best under GA. It enables one to do a good 
EUA. Yes, true, true. But of course, you have to balance with uh, some, some are actually small, so you can do, but that is the point that we are doing. That, that's the point we are giving. Don't, 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 don't fear GA. If you are not sure, if it looks bad, just go under GA. You'll be surprised. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Nyenze. Uh, I've not seen any other comment. Oh, one from Clarice. Thank you, Dr. Nyenze. We encounter a lot of lead lacerations in the county. Very good guidelines to the main challenges. So people have learned quite a lot from the presentation, practical points. Uh, myself too, I've learned quite a lot. I guess we never stop learning. So if there are no more comments, I think I can hand over to back to Dr. Kalu. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mukiri. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nyenze, for that excellent presentation. It is, um, I've learned a lot, I've remembered some things. So uh, in, in total, it has been a very wonderful uh, presentation. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for uh, your comments, your questions. Um, I think we might have to have Dr. Nyenze back again to expound on those things that he has said he didn't have time to do them today on another session. Um, I beg that we you give us your time. I know we have we have passed the time limit of 9.30, but we have a presentation from our sponsors for the day. And then after that, we'll have some uh, announcements from our desk and from Dr. Corrid before we close up. So please do not uh, abandon ship yet. Uh, without taking much time, I would like to welcome Evans from Dawa to give us a, a, a talk on, on his um, products so that we see where uh, they fit and where we can support each other in this ophthalmology journey. Karibu Evans. Thank you very much, Dr. Kalu. Uh, let me know once you can see my slides. Uh, we can now see your slides. You can proceed. All right, thank you. So first, let's take this opportunity to thank you, to thank the OSK for giving the, the opportunity to partner with you during this uh, CMEs and we are glad to partner with you and to be part of the educational trainings that uh, OSK is organizing for its members. So I'm Ivan Sambagara, product manager at Dawa Life Sciences and take you through a few of our products that we have to offer for the autonomic segment. So this is the new look Dawa. We have recently been undergoing rebranding and this is the new face of Dawa that you'll be seeing. A brief overview of who Dawa Life Sciences is. We said that we are a leading pharmaceutical manufacturer in East Africa, and our commitment is to deliver best value to patients through partnership with scientific community, investing good quality products, and medical education through such forums. And our promise is to ensure that we are offering quality and effective medication, ensuring an effective supply and distribution channel, and uh, upholding good manufacturing standards that are up to WHO standards. Uh, this is an overview of the DAO eye care solutions. We have two divisions. One is the eye drops division, and the other is the ophthalmic devices division. And uh, the eye drops division is uh, through the supply of products from Orolab. So we are the company that is licensed to uh, import on behalf of Orolab, which is uh, the manufacturing arm um, of the Aravind eye care system. And then our ophthalmic devices division, we supply the cedar palm products, which include the ophthalmic knives, drugular lenses, and the ophthalmic drips. Today, our focus will be uh, two key products. We have a wide portfolio of our eye drops, and we say that we are the one stop show for eye drops. And today, our focus will be on two products. First, I'll talk about Ketolac. 
this is uh, the Keterolac trimethamine 0.5 percent from uh, Orola, and we say that for clear vision affected by nuclear allergies and a postoperative inflammation, uh, Keterolac is a potent acid analgesic for the eyes. It is safe and effective in inflammatory conditions. Ketolac is recommended for reduction of ocular pain, irritation, burning or stinging following cataract and refractive surgery. It also acts as a conjunctival decongestant, uh, being an anti-inflammatory and being a COX-2 uh, a COX inhibitor. It's effective when used either as a monotherapy or as injectable therapy to steroids. It has anti-inflammatory action, which is attributed to be a result of its ability to inhibit prostaglandin biosynthesis, as I mentioned uh, being a COX inhibitor. It reduces prostaglandin two levels in the aqueous humor with the ocular administration, and we know that prostaglandin is uh, what leads to the inflammation that will be experienced. And the same mechanism of action confers to ketolac and analgesic and antipyrective activity. It effectively treats cystoid macular edema, inhibits meiosis, and may prevent cystoid macular edema when used both pre- and postoperatively. And it controls postoperative pain, discomfort, discomfort, and reduces the need for using other analgesics. Two key indications for ketolac, as uh, the ketolac brand from Orolab, which treats inflammation, swelling, and pain after corneal refractive surgery, and also after cataract surgery. It also can be used in the to treat eye irritation due to allergies. The dosage in the different conditions, if it's a corneal refractive surgery, you still one drop in the operated eyes four times a day as needed for pain and burning or stinging for up to four days following corneal refractive surgery. And when being used for post-op ocular inflammation, you still one drop in the affected eye or eyes twice a day, beginning the first day prior to cataract surgery, continuing on the one of surgery and through the first two weeks of post-operative period. So when addressing the seasonal allergy conjunctivitis, you still one drop in the affected eye up to four times in a day. And the next product I would like to focus on is an antibiotic, uh, Oroflox. Uh, this is Ofloxacin 0.3%, and it's a second generation chloroquinolone from Orolab. And we say it's a trusted choice for ocular infection. Oroflox has a wide spectrum of activity against all common gram positive and gram negative organisms, the powerful bactericidal activity. It is said not to form corneal deposits when used in treatment of corneal bacterial ulcers, and it's also more sensitive to gram positive organisms as compared to gatifloxacin and moxifloxacin, specifically in the treatment of. It's effective in conjunctivitis, particularly caused by gram-positive bacteria such as Staphylococcus aureus, Staphylococcus epididymis, and Streptococcus pneumonia. For the gram-negative bacterial bacteria, it's effective against Staphylococcus aureus, Haemophilus influenza, Proteus mirabilis, and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And also when addressing corneal ulcers caused by gram-positive bacteria, such as Staphylococcus aureus, sorry, staph epididymis, and strep pneumonia. The gram negative bacteria, such as Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Seratia, Massesense, and if it's for anaerobic species, such as the, such as the Propinium bacterium acnes. For dosage, when addressing bacterial conjunctivitis, on the first day and second, you still one to two drops every two to four hours in the affected eyes. And this three through to seven, you still one to two drops four times daily. When addressing bacterial corneal ulcers, for the first and second day, you still two, one to two drops to the affected eye every 30 minutes while awake. Awaken at approximately four to six hours after retiring, and you still one to two drops. On the day three, through seven and nine, and still one to two drops hourly while awake. 
day seven to nine through treatment completion, we still want two drops four times daily. And that's it on the auto flocks. And just a mention, uh, we also have a antibiotic and steroid combination, top decks, which was subject of discussion last time. So this is just a mention for dual benefit in infected and inflammatory iron. Thank you very much. And uh, also, again, to reiterate our gratitude for offering an, an opportunity to partner with you during these uh, meetings. Our products are available. We hope that you can actually pass the benefits to your patients. Our reps will be visiting new people to just share more information on our product range. Thank you very much. And well to Dr. Kalu. Uh, thank you very much, Evans, for a very comprehensive um, a breakdown on your products. Um, I hope we will, our patients will be able to afford them both from the high end to the low end. So if uh, you can, you will uh, help us with uh, uh, managing your prices so that everyone is able to access the best care possible. Thank you, Sana, also for partnering with us. We are very grateful for making this uh, uh, session possible. Um, I am going to now invite Dr. Korir for a word, and then I will finish up and close for the day. Dr. Karibu. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kalu, for the uh, wonderful uh, you know, moderation, Dr. Mukur, uh, Mukiri and Dr. Nyenze. I must say I was very happy to see a very shiny and clear cornea in that first patient. That was my first worry. And I think you did a very good job. Uh, very nice presentations. Uh, just some quick two announcements. One is that I'm delighted to inform you that now OSK has got an office. Uh, it's located in KMA, uh, KMA Center. So you go to seventh floor, uh, the fourth, um, it's called suit, four, suit number four. So KMA Center, uh, seventh floor, suit number four. So you, uh, we have an administrator there, he's called Mr. Evans. He'll be very happy to help you with any questions you have. I think it's, a, it's an accessible location to everyone. So please feel free to visit, just even to say hi, so that uh, at least you get to know him before you need him. If you need to pay any you know, uh, subscriptions or anything, you need to swipe your card on things like that, uh, you can do that at the office. So I'd like to encourage everybody to just pay a visit there once in a while. Um, the second announcement is just to encourage everybody to you know, uh, pay up subscriptions. Very many people have already done that. And that's very encouraging uh, uh, to see the numbers. Um, so I'd like to just remind the people who haven't you know, it, uh, to just do that. Um, at the end of the year, when we have our conference, you know, there'll be a added benefit you know, if you're a member. So it's, it would be good for you to just uh, make sure that you do that. Uh, so thank you very much. And thank you all for attending. I can see very good numbers attending today's CME show. It's a very interesting topic. Thank you. Back to you, Carl. Thank you, Dr. Kurir. Um, I A few announcements before we close. I would like to encourage us to be registering when uh, the flyers come up for the CMEs. It helps us also in uh, in planning for the webinar so that we make sure we are able to include everyone and expand our capacity for participants if uh, and when need be. So kindly uh, try and register. We will still try and avail the meeting ID and passcode for those ones who will have difficulty in registering. But if so. um, also, I would like us to, I would like to bring to your attention that Finally, we have our recordings for all our CMEs are going to be available on our YouTube, YouTube channel. So please, if you've missed any or you want a recap, go to the Ophthalmology Society of Kenya YouTube channel um, and you'll be able to get the recordings. For today's presentation, um, that will be up from Monday next week. But uh, we are aiming to always have them there as soon as possible, but uh, the ones that have been um, been presented since January this year, they will be pre uh, available on YouTube. And also we are 
in the works to make them available on the website. You might go and not find all of them, but we are trying to make sure we have all of them uploaded. Um, so those are the announcements for today. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you for, uh, for, for showing us a, a, a great attendance, which encourages us even to do more and to make sure these uh, sessions are successful. Thank you, Dr. Nyenze, for such a wonderful presentation again. Dr. Mukiri, thank you for the wonderful uh, moderation. And um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, we hope we'll meet again in the next two weeks for yet another uh, session on oculoplasty. So uh, without much, kindly, uh, you are free to leave and uh, have a good evening. Thank you.